Hey guys, welcome to BP, the Bible Perspective. Part eight of our pre-tribulation rapture, our in-depth study. And we're asking the question, where are we in prophecy? And here you see a prophetic picture of the uh, whole end time scenario. Now, before we continue, please like and share this video and subscribe to BP, the Bible Perspective. And as always, if you have a thought or comment, add to the comment section below. All comments are welcome. Okay, we're, we're doing a deep dive and in, into Bible prophecy, an in-depth study. And, I, and I'm going to say that I think this, other than scholarly studies, you know, looking at different other kind of scholastic studies. So on my level, yeah, we're doing one of the most in-depth studies. I'm, I'm not a scholar. That's why I say that. So I'm not going to try to put myself on the same level as scholars. So there are a lot of books out there, commentaries and stuff that really do a deep dive. Probably, I'm going to say even a deeper dive into what I'm doing because they'll get more into Greek and Hebrew words and study. Um, my studies are plain and simple, just Bible study from the standpoint of just a common person who can read, <coughs> excuse me, and understand the scripture. So we're doing a deep dive, however, because I think one of the mistakes that we make in when we teach or embark on our study of end times is we center on just a few scriptures a few verses, and that's a mistake. Bible prophecy, though not hard, it is, as all things are in Scripture, easy to understand. Some people have a hard time with that, but it is. God did not give us revelation, the Scriptures, and then make it hard for us to understand or unattainable. You know, not un, it, he. It, it was meant that were, if it's revealed, it's for us, so that we can read it, plainly understand it, and then do it. Now, the difference with a subject like Bible prophecy is that it is exhaustive. There's a lot of scripture. That's why I said it's a mistake to frame your theology or theological view of end times just on a few verses. And I think so many people do that. But we're going to look at all of the scriptures, or at least most of the scriptures. I'm sure we're not going to cover all of them in the Bible, but I'm going to try to cover most of them. Or at least to give cover enough to say, here is the general picture of what scripture is saying in time. Now, I hold to what's called a pre-tribulation rapture view. There are three commonly held views. There are some couple of others. Uh, I did mention them in the earlier sections, such as all millennials, but I'm not going to spend time on that because I, I think that is one of the weakest arguments. Because in a sense, what they say is that uh, the scriptures is allegorical. So in, in, anyway, like I can say, I'm not going to get into that, but I want to say what among Evangelicals, we could say there are three commonly held views. One is the, what I hold to is the pre-tribulation rapture. Now, when we talk about the rapture of the church, we're talking about God removing the church from the earth or catching it up or rapture. There are those that hold to a mid-tribulation rapture. And then there are those that say that the church will not be raptured until the end of the tribulation period. Now, when we talk about the tribulation period, we're talking about not so much as the sufferings and the persecutions that the church or Christians go through, what we call tribulations of life, but a very specific time that the Bible says that God will judge the sinful world. And so the tribulation period is very specific, and therein is the debate. Now, there is, of late, 
those who try to say, well, the church is going to go through the tribulation period, but not pre-wrath. I'll get into that in another time. So what we have been doing is now, again, going point by point. And we, we're, in a sense, we started with the book of Matthew, with Jesus' um, prophecy on the end times. We'll go come back to that. What I want to do, um, well, let me tell you this. Last time we left off in Daniel's, because we're talking about Daniel's 70-week prophecy. And one of the things we backtracked on and said, well, let's look at, well, what was Daniel, why did Daniel arrive at that? Well, one, he was studying the book of Jeremiah. And then he said, oh, wait a minute, Jeremiah prophesied that the exile the, the, of, uh, of Israel would be 70 years and the 70 years is almost up so then Gabriel the angel was dispatched to give Daniel understanding now before that and we go back a number of years in Daniel's life when he first arrived and he was deported into Babylon and when he was deported uh, King Nebuchadnezzar was given a dream by God and that Daniel interpreted. And this would cause his fame. He became one of the most trusted advisors of Nebuchadnezzar. Well, one of the, the, the dream that he had was it was a human statue or human image. Now, none of Nebuchadnezzar's magicians could interpret the dream. And obviously, because God was the one who gave it to him, and God gave them the interpretation to his man, his prophet Daniel. But what that image revealed was four major world dominating kingdoms from Nebuchadnezzar's time to the end of the world. And so it was four kingdoms. And what was different about these kingdoms? unlike other mighty kingdoms, such as the Assyrian uh, Empire or the Egyptian Empire, was that these kingdoms would rule the entire world. So you had Babylon, who was the head of gold, and God said that was the greatest of these kingdoms. And then you had the Persian kingdom, or the Median Persian. And that Median Persian is kind of very important because doing this kingdom here, King Cyrus, God gives a very detailed prophecy of a prophetic countdown. He says, when Cyrus, the Median Persian kingdom, issues the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, it would be like it was a seven, it was a 69 week prophetic time clock. I'll get back to that later when we kind of go back into the 70 weeks of Daniel. But that's a very important one because the 69 weeks brings us up to um, the, the, the crucifixion of Jesus. The third kingdom was the Grecian kingdom ruled by Alexander the Great. And then the last was the Roman Empire. But then you also have these ten, uh, the ten toes, which of iron and clay. Now, we haven't gotten to these kingdoms yet, but as we look back on prophetic time, because those kings will arise during the um, evil rule of the man of sin or the beast. Okay. Now, my question also was, how can we locate ourselves in prophecy? In other words, if you're reading prophecy properly, you're, you're, you're able to locate yourself. So, for example, look at this picture here. When Daniel was reading, he was able to locate himself prophetically by reading the prophecies of Jeremiah, which said the exile would only last for 70 years. Up, 70 years are almost up. And that put him into the Mede and Persian kingdom. Now, so in, think about this. So in each one of these time kind of frames, if you were in the Grecian kingdom, 
you were able to read the prophecies of Daniel and be able to say, hey, here's where we are prophetically. The Grecian kingdoms and then ultimately the untimely death of Alexander and then his kingdom being divided among his four generals. He flat we move forward. We're able to say, where are we in prophecy? Well, Rome, right? The legs of iron. Rome. Okay. Now we can also say, here's where we're not in times with the ten kingdoms or the ten toes. We're not there yet. So my point is, if you're reading prophecy properly, you can locate your where we are in in, um, in Bible prophecy. I'm going to get more into that in a moment. Let me uh, share my screen, and uh, let me also do this. I want to read where we have been studying our two scriptures since we are in part eight of the pre-rapture. Uh, and I first started off with biblical proofs of the pre-rapture. But this is what I'm doing, an in-depth study. But I want to read something here. Uh, and it says, this is the um, second coming. It said, look, he is coming with the clouds. And every eye will see him, including those that pierce him. And all the families of the earth will mourn over him. This is certain amen. So this is the second coming of Jesus. And we're, again, we're obviously going to unpack that more. And then in um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the archangel's voice, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are still alive will be caught up together. Now that word caught up is how we get the word rapture. But the word caught up is the biblical word. Because some people will say, well, rapture is not even in the Bible. Well, caught up is. So he says, then we, we who are still alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so will we always be with the Lord. Now, those are kind of our two verses here. This clearly talks about the rapture of the church. But as I said, it doesn't state when it's going to happen. So we have to acknowledge that. But there's a clear difference between the second coming of Jesus and the rapture of the church. Okay. But let's we're going to unpack this even further. So let me go back to Daniel chapter uh, Daniel chapter 9. So, well, you know what? Let me do this. Let me um go to Daniel chapter 2 and just quickly go over the image. Okay, so this is interpretation of the dream that Nebuchadnezzar saw. He says, this was the dream. Now we would tell the king its interpretation. Your majesty, you are the king of kings, the God of heaven. It's given you sovereignty, power, strength, and glory. Wherever people live, or wild animals, birds of the air, he has handed them over to you and made you ruler over them all. You are the head of gold. After you, there will rise another kingdom inferior to yours, and then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which will rule the whole earth. So notice that. Distinctive there. Verse 40. A fourth kingdom will be as strong as iron, for iron crushes and shadows everything, and like iron that smashes, it will crush and smash all the others. We saw the feet and toes partly of the potter, fired clay and partly of iron. It will be a divided kingdom, though some of its strength, iron, will be in it. And you saw the iron mixed with clay and that the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly fired clay. Part of the kingdom will be strong and part will be brittle. Uh, brittle. And you saw an iron mixed with clay and the peoples were mixed with another. They would not hold together just as iron does not mix with fired clay. 
in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. And this kingdom will not be left to another. It will crush all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, but will itself endure forever. You saw a stone break, break off from a mountain without a hand touching it. It crushed the iron, bronze, fired clay, silver, and gold. The great God told the king what will happen in the future. The dream is true and the interpretation is certain. So one of the things you want to see about this image, and I, but I showed you that picture, kind of the artist rendition of that picture of the four kingdoms that gave us a picture of man's time, the kingdoms of the world, till the end, till the coming of Jesus. That That's a picture of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Now, as I said before, the book of Daniel now, from 6, chapter 7 on, is an interpretation of this image. In other words, all those chapters is primarily an interpretation of this image that Daniel just prophesied. And again, so you see this image of man. It represents man's time on earth till Jesus comes and destroys the kingdom of man and sets up his own kingdoms. Now with that, let's go back to chapter 9. And um, um, I want to get into the 70 weeks of Daniel now and really kind of unpack that. So we see... Um, I, I, let me say this, that the prophecies, the prophecies are of what the, 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 the end of the world, as Daniel just gave us, the prophecies then are the four kingdoms to Jesus comes. And there's another thing about the prophecies is God's plan and purpose for the nation of Israel. God's plan and purpose for the nation of Israel. Now, this is important. So when we see this here, um, this is um, Gabriel giving now a prophecy. Daniel was reading Jeremiah, and he says he locates himself prophetically and says the 70 years are almost up. But this now is a prophecy that now the angel Gabriel was sent to give to Daniel. And this is what he says here, verse 24. 70 weeks are decreed about your people in your holy city to bring rebellion to an end, to put a stop to sin, to wipe away iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to set up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Let's back up for a moment, look. So 70 weeks. So these 70 weeks, in the term week here, will be a seven-year period of time. So 70 weeks or 70 sets of seven-year periods of time, right? 70 weeks are decreed. Now watch this, and this is important, about your people. Now who are the people that he was referring to? Well, all throughout here, he's been talking about, um, again, the prophecy of Israel, okay? Why can you read this here? That's what he's referring to here. Um, uh, let's just show you. Well, um, <laughs> uh, now this is his prayer. Okay, this is his prayer. 
So then look up in verse uh, 2 again. In the first year of his reign, meaning Darius, uh, uh, and then he says, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the books, according to the word of the Lord, to Jeremiah the prophet, the number of years for the desolation of Jerusalem. So the, pro the, the prophetic message here is all about God's plan and purpose for Israel. Okay. So now he says, seven weeks of decree upon your people. He is referring to the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, and, and the holy city, which is Jerusalem. Okay. So then he goes in verse 25 and he says, no one understand this from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince. Now I want to stop here because uh, let me go and just read Ezra. Um, Ezra chapter 1. So, because I want you to see in comparison so that we can have clear understanding. So like I say, which to me is plain and simple. Okay. So this is Ezra. And Ezra was a scribe. And he, and from Daniel's perspective, he comes a few, just a few short years after. They probably, Daniel's contemporary, but they probably don't know one another. And again, at this time, the, the, the world kingdoms has passed from Babylon to the, the Medes and Persians. The Medes and Persians had conquered the kingdom of Babylon. So this this is this is important because this is what we see. Now, by the way, from Daniel's standpoint, this is just a few short years. But listen to what happens here. Chapter 1, verse 1 says, In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, the word of the Lord spoken through Jeremiah was fulfilled. The Lord put it into the mind of the king, King Cyrus, to issue a proclamation throughout his entire kingdom and put it in writing. Here is the decree. This is what King Cyrus of Persia says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and has appointed me to build him a house at Jerusalem in Judah. Okay. Whoever among his people, may his God be with him, and may he go to Jerusalem in Judah and build the house of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem. Let every survivor who lives be assisted by the men of that region with silver, gold, goods, livestock, along with free will offerings for the house of God in Jerusalem. Okay. So, now, let's go back a few short years. Here is Daniel. Here is Gabriel, the angel speaking to Daniel. And this is what he says. No one understand this. From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, until Messiah, the prince, will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Stop. So know this, he said, from the issuing of the decree. We just read the decree. So not only then over here that this decree, right? Not only did this decree um, send the exiles back to Jerusalem, and we, if you go back and you read the book of Ezra here in, in the book of um, uh, Nehemiah, okay, uh, that's, this is the journey. They're going to go back to Jerusalem after the 70 years exile. The city is in complete ruin. It is, it is completely destroyed. It's been laying waste for 70 years. They're going to go back and they're going to rebuild the wall and the temple. But not only, but understand that not only did this decree give or the fulfillment of what God said, it also starts a prophetic timeline. He says, no one understand this from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Now we just read the decree. 
until Messiah, now he jumps ahead, to the prince would be seven weeks and 62 weeks, or 69 weeks. It will be rebuilt with a plaza in the moat, but in difficult times. But after those 62 weeks, the Messiah would be cut off and would have nothing. I'll stop. So, if I am, if I am, uh, where am I going to go here with this? Uh, if I'm the apostles, well, you know what? Let me, uh, <laughs> Let me go to Acts. Go to Acts chapter 1. Now, I, I'm going to contrast this because I think this is kind of interesting. Watch this. So, while he was together with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise. This is Acts 1, uh, chapter, I mean, verse 4. For the pro uh, wait for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you've heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom to Israel at this time? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times and periods that the Father is set by his own authority. Now, but they should have known the times, however. There wasn't they were thinking completely off by asking this because if you were right here doing this time and you read here after 62 weeks the Messiah would be cut off. So uh, from the issuing of the decree to the restoring of the rebuilding of Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince would be seven weeks and 62 weeks or 69 weeks. So right here, we see the Messiah is cut off. After 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and we'll have nothing. So after 62 weeks, right, the Messiah is cut off. Well, if I'm standing here with Jesus, hmm, 69 weeks, right, 69 weeks, ding, ding, right, are you restoring the kingdom? Now, here's where they're missing it, right? Because I'm, we're going to get to where they're missing it. The timing is not altogether off in their case. 69 weeks, right? But they're, what they're not understanding, here's where they're off at. They're not, they, they've, they kind of forgot to add the 70th week. In which he said, it's not for you to know the times and periods that the Father has put in his own authority. So, had they properly then understood Daniel's 70 weeks, right? They would have said, here's where we are prophetically. Between week 69 and week 70. This is where we are right now. So when they asked the question of him, are you restoring the kingdom to Israel at this time? They should have known we're still missing that 70th week. So Jesus answered them, that's not for you to know the times or periods. So, this, so, there, so in other words, there are times and there are periods. We'll get back, we're going to unpack this a little more because verse 8 is what he tells them to proceed, how to proceed. What I think we should understand here, let's go back to Daniel, right? So 69 weeks or, eh, where's my clock here? I mean, uh, thing here, I want to uh, do a little cheat sheet since I'm not thinking with my mind. So seven times 69, 483 years, right? And then if you say divided by seven, that's 69, okay? 69, seven-year periods of time, right? So I just kind of 
mathematically gave you how we come out with one week because there's still one week to go and if you divide that 69 weeks it comes out to 69 <laughs> uh, uh, set of seven year period of time now he says so um, so there's a couple of things that we need to know about this because this is where it gets interesting so the 69 weeks places us and he tells us here he gives us the details that the 69 weeks places us at the crucifixion of Jesus okay so let me read something now and then I we're not going to study it but just read it so after 62 weeks the Messiah will be cut off and we have nothing stop that's the period so that's so so right there week 69 and then he goes on to say the people of the coming prince will destroy the city and the sanctuary the end will come with the flood until the end there will be war desolations are decreed he will make a firm covenant with many for one week but in the middle of the week he will put a stop to sacrifice and offerings and the abomination of desolation will be on the wing of the temple until the decree destruction is poured out on the desolator so he will make a covenant for one week so here's where we get the 70th week that hasn't happened yet how do we know now we're going to come back to acts we're going to come back to acts but let's go to matthew 24 again because i want to uh again read this oh no uh matthew uh 24 and verse 15 now i'm gonna not in in this session here but probably in the, in the next couple of sessions we're going to come back and contrast acts one with this okay um because i think here we I'm, I'm, i'll give you a little foreshadowing that here what we see is week 69 and week 70. Okay. And then what I want you to see here in verse 15. So when you see the abomination that calls desolation, spoken by prophet Daniel, <clears throat> standing in the holy place. So right there, let the reader understand. Then those in Judea must flee to the mountains. A man on the housetop must not come down to get things out of his house. And a man in the field must not go back to get his clothes. Go to the pregnant women and nursing mother in those days. Pray that your escape may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. For at that time there would be great tribulation. The kind that is not taking place at the beginning of the world until now or and will never again. And also days will survive, but those days uh, but um, unless those days were limited, no no one would survive, but those days will be limited because of the elect. Now, here's what I want you to see here. When you see the abomination, notice this, they call this desolation, spoken by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place. So this is not talking about the church. So how do I get, this is the 70th week. Because Jesus says here, when you see this, that was spoken by Daniel. Well, here's Daniel. He will confirm the covenant. Verse 27, he will confirm the covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to the sacrifice and offerings. And the abomination of desolation will be on the wing of the temple. Now, let me skip down to chapter 12. And... Uh, and look at this here because he mentions this again um verse number 11 from the time 
the daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination of desolation is set up. That would be 1290 days. The one who waits and reach 12, uh, reaches 12, thir uh, 1335 days is blessed. Now, I want you to understand he mentioned this again. So what we're going to do is we'll come back to this. And again, we're going to continue with this. This abomination that makes desolation. That happens in the 70th week of Daniel. So we're going to go back and say, what's going on between week 69 and week 70? We'll get into that in the next study. Don't forget to like and share this video and subscribe to BP, the Bible Perspective. And as always, if you have a thought or comment, add to the comment section below. All comments are welcome. And I'll see you. And I do mean that all comments are welcome. Um, but um, I'll see you in the next study.